Check out today's piece of Otaku Daikun fan art. Here we've got the artist's OC, using a Rider Iskandar install card, like in Prisma Elia. I like the line work on the fluffy robe. It's like a fiery lion's mane. Very cool. Thank you so much, Fro Anime. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here. It's time to cover the second Lost Belt in Fate Grand Order, Guta Demoong, Eternal Ice Flame Century, also known as the Norse or Scandinavian Lost Belt. This chapter follows up directly where the previous one left off. After the collapse of the Russian Lost Belt, our Chaldean party in the Shadow Border got a transmission from a mage claiming to be from the Wandering Sea. I won't dwell too long on them, considering I have an entire lesson in Magecraft on the subject, but the Wandering Sea is the third branch of the Mages Association. It's even more secretive than the Atlas organization in Egypt. So secret, in fact, that their headquarters isn't even on the same plane of reality as us. It exists on a different texture, and normally it only makes itself visible to the rest of the world once a year, on December 31st. Normally, mages of the Wandering Sea have no interest in modern affairs, instead concerning themselves with magecraft from the Age of Gods. Thus, it's strange for us to suddenly be getting a transmission from them. Though, it does make sense that of all places in the world to survive the planet's bleaching, the Wandering Sea would still be intact. After all, it's basically just a giant mountain-sized island surrounded by torrential waters, in its own little pocket dimension of sorts. Considering we're just this single tank driving in a desolate world of light, we can use all the help we can get, so we set course to where the broadcast is coming from, the oceans to the north. Sadly, we've got to do this the hard way, physically driving across the landscape. Due to a shortage of energy, we can only zero sail when absolutely necessary, and even then, only for a short period of time. Even worse, the shadow border isn't properly equipped to deal with oceanic travel. Our safest bet is to stay on land, but that means driving through the Scandinavian Peninsula, which just so happens to be taken up by a Lost Belt storm wall. In other words, ironically, the safest route to the Wandering Sea's coordinates requires us to enter yet another Lost Belt. It'll take two days for the border to reach the Lost Belt's edge, so in the meantime, we prepare to interrogate Kadok, whom we captured during the previous Lost Belt. We hope to ask him all sorts of stuff, such as his motivation, the other cryptors, the fantasy trees, and how the Lost Belts work in general. But before we get the chance, the Shadow Border gets attacked by an intruder. Aw, oh, piss! It's Key Ray, god damn it! Like a madman, he chases after the Border and hops on top, creating enough of a distraction for Kadok to escape his confinement and head for the roof. There, Key Ray stabs Kadok with his hand and declares that he's come to kill the young master. Instead, Kirei actually rescues Kadok, making it look like a murder so we don't try to pursue them. Turns out, Kirei's under orders from Kirstaria to bring Kadok back to the Olympus Lost Belt. Apparently, Kadok still has use to the alien god, considering he still has a serious light, the powerful command spell capable of shaping reality. So damn, no more Kadok for us. Accepting the loss, the Shadow Border moves on, and our party explores some buildings that have managed to stay intact through the whitening. We find traces of survivors, but no actual people among the ruins. Soon enough, we reach our next Lost Belt Stormwall. Our goal is to, ideally, enter the Lost Belt and exit the other side without causing a commotion. We will use two short-distance zero sails to slip past the wall on each end. Things go according to plan, until, during our zero sail, we pick up readings of a mysterious pursuer. It appears that someone or something other than us is also able to survive in void space. But because all of our energy is devoted to the Zero Sail, we can't get a look at our enemy via the windows or cameras. Mashu doesn't sense any hostility, but Gordoff doesn't want to take any risks, and so we make an emergency exit from void space. Without discovering the identity of the mysterious presence, we instead end our Zero Sail and emerge inside the Lost Belt. That said, let's go over today's Lost Belt. As I mentioned previously, Lost Belts are alternative timelines where history significantly diverges from what the universe considers to be proper. In this case, that divergence occurred in the year 1000 BC, a time when Norse deities thrived across Scandinavia. More specifically, it was at the end of such an era, known in Norse mythology as Ragnarok. 
During proper human history, this was a series of events in which the gods perished and the land flooded with water, ending with the rebirth of humanity. It was essentially the end of the Age of Gods for Scandinavia. In this Lost Belt, however, Ragnarok did not occur as prophesized. Thanks to the giant Surtur, king of Muspelheim, the realm of fire. He was to bring about the twilight of the gods, but instead attempted to change his fate. Surtur was the member of a race known as the Jotnar. Commonly, the Jotnar are a race of giants, but not everyone who's considered one matches that description. For instance, there are various Norse gods who happen to descend from the Jotnar. In turn, the Jotnar themselves originate from the body of Ymir, a proto-being whose dismembered corpse was said to have created the world. Surtur, as a fire Jotun, was supposed to burn the land's nine realms, and from their ashes the world would be reborn anew. The difference in this Lost Belt is that Sortor wanted to not only torch away the Age of Gods, but the entire world altogether, leaving no room for humanity to thrive. As such, he took actions that subverted what Ragnarok had prophesized. Normally, the monstrous wolf Fenrir, the child of Loki, was supposed to kill the Allfather God Odin after swallowing the sun. Instead, Surtur attacked Fenrir when his guard was down, having just swallowed the sun, and proceeded to tear apart and devour Fenrir. Through this, Surtur inherited Fenrir's divine authority, becoming far more powerful. He rampaged the Nine Realms, killing most of the gods with no sign of stopping. This prompted Odin, who himself was on the verge of death, to seal Surtur in a false sun, putting an end to the chaos. Even so, this was no peace. Ragnarok had not been finished. The fighting abated, but there was no rebirth, leaving the Scandinavian mountains torched by the flames of Muspelheim above. These flames, Sortor's lingering might, needed to be suppressed, and to do so, Odin entrusted the land to its last surviving god, Skadi. She was the daughter of Thiazi, a powerful Jotun whom the gods murdered over a dispute. In reparation for her father's untimely death, Skadi was granted the chance to marry one of the gods. She became the Bride of Njordr, the God of the Sea, and she was welcomed as the beautiful Bride of the Gods. As part of their marriage, Skadi inherited Njordr's stepchildren Froyr and Freya. Despite her marriage to a God of the Sea, Skadi remained in the mountains as a queen of ice and snow, gifted in the use of Odin's primordial runes, which was ideal for opposing Surtur's scalding flames. It is said that Skadi's mythology first originated from that of the Celtic hero Skahak, and to spare Skadi from Surtur's wrath, Odin combined the two figures into a single deity, Skahak Skadi. This took the last of Odin's strength. He perished, entrusting Skadi with the fate of humanity, ordering his two raven familiars, Hugin and Munin, to watch over her from the sky. Such a task proved difficult for Skadi. A large portion of her power is required to suppress Surtur's flames. And even though she can push the flames back to the mountaintops by coating the land in a beautiful snow, she also has to contend with the many giants left behind by Surtur's rampage. As the daughter of a prominent Jotun, Skadi has a degree of authority over giants, but the ones that survived Ragnarok are particularly aggressive. The best she can do is suppress them with masks infused with her mana. Scandinavia which was not reborn through Ragnarok, proves infertile for the few humans who dare to inhabit the land. Nonetheless, Skadi devotes herself to protecting these humans as best as she can. That said, between the giants and Surtur's flames, Skadi's best is limited. She can only accommodate a controlled population of 10,000 humans between 100 separate villages, each protected by a bounded field to keep the giants at bay. Even worse, she lacks the resources to protect these humans into adulthood and must impose strict limits on who can survive. Children are permitted to live until the age of 15, or as late as 25 if they bear children. At this point, the adults are told to leave their villages, where they will most definitely be crushed by the barbaric giants outside. These limitations are pitiful to say the least. Humanity's stagnation, never being able to overcome this strict system, is the reason why their Scandinavia became a lost belt in the first place. Skadi knew such a world was destined for pruning, and so she took it as a miracle when the alien god preserved it. While she could not provide for any more humans, Skadi still loved all of them as her own children, and continued to serve as the lost belt's king for 3,000 years. Thankfully, she wasn't all alone during this endeavor. She had help from the Valkyries Thrud, Hildur, and Ortlinda. 
The Valkyries were beings created by Odin during the Twilight of the Gods. They were tasked with dancing across the skies of battle in search of the souls of valiant warriors whom they could escort back to Valhalla. In some ways, the Valkyries can be considered automata, as they think in sort of a hive mind, computationally processing situations according to the orders given to them. And yet, they are also each individuals, capable of their own emotions and wills. It's this contrast between the collective and the individual that make them so unique. At the end of Surtur's rampage, three of the Valkyries survived and vowed to assist Skadi as a proxy for their creator Odin. To compensate for only having three, Skadi was able to mass-produce copies of Thrud, Hildur, and Ortlinda, forming a functioning army that the original three could each command. They serve Skadi in fighting off the giants, as well as communicating with the villages. They facilitate the ritual by which older humans leave the village. In the latter end of her 3,000-year reign, Skadi was finally greeted by her Lost Belt's cryptor, Ophelia Famersalone, and was also graced with the fantasy tree Sombrero. Unlike the fantasy tree in Russia, Sombrero spread its roots and can even release seeds. While it's an improvement, Skadi can't take advantage of the tree's abilities while maintaining Surtur's seal. As her name implies, Ophelia was born as the heir to the Famersalone Magus family. This meant that her parents had lofty expectations of her to succeed the family line as a first-rate mage. To that end, they subjected Ophelia to many painful operations, hoping to cultivate in her a jewel-ranked mystic eye of Aether, the sixth imaginary element. For reference, this means possessing a mystic eye on par with, say, Medusa's. For mages in the modern era, that's a huge deal. Thanks to this, Ophelia's parents didn't provide her love or emotional support, only pressure to improve as a mage. This caused her to develop a quiet, introverted personality. Her lack of self-esteem made her afraid to get close to others. Nonetheless, she performed well in the clock tower as part of the spiritual evocation department. Her talent as a student got her recruited into Caldea's Team A. There, she was able to find a genuine friend in Mashu, as well as a love interest in Kirstaria. The fruit of her family's magecraft is her mystic Eye of Prolongation. It is a powerful eye that can function in two parts. First, she can see the various possibilities or potential futures of her target. And second, she can actually cull them so that events only follow a single course. In practice, this means that she can look at an opponent, eliminate all possibilities in which they succeed, and force them down a path where they fail. It's very similar to Musashi's state of nothingness in swordsmanship, except in Musashi's case she's guaranteeing a single path for her own success, rather than imposing a path on others. Semantics aside, Ophelia was primed to be a valuable asset to Caldea, but that all changed when Lev Liner's explosion had the members of Team A dying in their coffins. Thanks to her mystic eye, Ophelia was able to see things the other cryptors couldn't. From her own coffin, Ophelia was able to witness the interaction between Kirstaria and the alien god. She learned how Kirstaria took on excess pain in order to save the other cryptors, and this further strengthened her already devoted love toward him. Another of Ophelia's visions was far less welcome, however. One of the possibilities she gleamed in her coffin was, surprisingly, that of the sealed Surtur in the Norse Lost Belt. The two of them, confined to solitude, found themselves in a similar situation, having failed as their respective worlds appeared to be coming to an end. It seems fitting, then, that Ophelia was put in charge of the very same Lost Belt she had envisioned. To fight on her behalf, Ophelia summoned a saber servant, Sigurd, the greatest hero of Northern Europe. The first thing to understand about Sigurd is that he shares a common legend with the hero Siegfried. They're each a variation of the same basic idea, a great hero who slayed a dangerous dragon with a legendary sword. Sigurd's tale, in particular, is told in the Volsunga saga, in which his father, King Sigmund of Frackland, died while fighting Odin. As such, Sigurd was raised by a dwarven blacksmith, using his talents to revive the sword Gram, the blade his father had pulled from a great tree. Sigurd later used the sword to slay the dragon Fafnir, by devouring the dragon's heart, he obtained divine power and wisdom. A critical part of his legend is his romance with the eldest Valkyrie, Brynhildr. I mentioned before that Valkyries were fascinating for the contrast between their collective loyalty and individual desires, and Brynhildr is the main catalyst for this. She was one of Odin's finest warriors, loyally gathering heroic souls to Valhalla for Ragnarok. In one instance, however, she actually defied Odin by supporting a warrior he had not chosen. 
This hero, Agnar, wound up defeating Hilma Gunnar, the hero Odin had already promised victory. Odin be pissed, y'all. He punished Brynhildr for her betrayal by stripping away much of her divinity and sealing her in a death-like state at Mount Hinderfjall, enclosed in a hall of flames. It was our boy Sigurd who saved Brynhildr from captivity, charging through the flames on his steed. There was a prophecy that stated if the two of them fell in love, they would meet tragedy, and so Sigurd hoped to merely rescue her without getting attached. Oof. Turns out it was love at first sight for both of them. They got married, and during their honeymoon, Brynhildr taught Sigurd all the cool shit she learned from Odin, namely those badass primordial runes. Eventually, Sigurd left her to continue his hero's journey, and she decided to loyally await his return. She had no idea her own husband would get NTR'd. A brother and sister pair, Gudrun and Gunther, thought to marry Sigurd and Brynhildr respectively, and enacted a plan to tear them apart. Sigurd was tricked into drinking an alcohol that made him forget Brynhildr. This allowed Gunther to propose to her, and so she imposed a trial, whereby she would only marry a man who could defeat her in combat. Gunther didn't have the balls to do this, so he got Sigurd to pretend to be him and fight in his stead. As such, Brynhildr wound up in a duel with her true husband Sigurd, but he had forgotten their love and was pretending to be another man. She knew it was Sigurd, but was devastated to see him trying to get her to marry someone else. Even worse, Sigurd had grown to be much stronger than her, in part thanks to the skills she initially taught him. Sigurd won the fight, and she was obligated to marry Gunther, while Gunther's sister Gudrun married Sigurd. Brynhildr couldn't stand to live like this, and proceeded to go on a rampage, slaughtering her beloved Sigurd and all of his family before taking her own life. It was a tragedy of two lovers torn apart through wicked scheming. Regardless, Sigurd was a renowned hero who would have made a wonderful servant for Ophelia, if not for one major flaw. When she summoned the hero, she accidentally summoned Surtur along with him. Her mystic eye, which had witnessed Surtur prior, served as a catalyst to manipulate her summoning. As such, the servant she summoned was indeed Sigurd, but he was being controlled by Surtur. In this sense, Surtur had created an opportunity to escape his fake son, vicariously through Sigurd. You see, if Sigurd's spirit origin is shattered, Surtur inside his body will escape, in turn allowing Surtur to free his actual body within the sun. When Surtur revealed his intention to burn the planet once free from Sigurd's death, Ophelia used her command spells to forbid him from committing suicide. As such, the only way for Surtur to escape is to have Sigurd die in a legitimate fight to the death. To Ophelia, he is an extremely dangerous loose cannon. After all, compared to the other cryptors, Ophelia is definitely the most compassionate. Despite opposing proper human history alongside her beloved Kirstaria, she isn't too keen on fighting Caldea. When they were together in Team A, Ophelia and Mashu were close friends, and so Ophelia struggles to rein in her servant's violent tendencies. Ophelia's compassion further reared its head when, in response to Sigurd, Brynhildr was also summoned as a free servant from proper human history. Because of her legend, Brynhildr is compelled to reenact her tragedy by killing Sigurd once more, which is exactly what Ophelia wants to avoid. However, Ophelia sympathized with Brynhildr's tragedy, and instead of killing her, she teamed up with the other Valkyries to once again seal Brynhildr in an imitation of the Palace of Fire. Naturally, the Valkyries didn't want to fight their own sister either, even if she was from proper human history. In addition to Brynhildr, two other free servants found themselves summoned to the Lost Belt in an attempt to protect the human order. The first is a strange case, a joint summoning of three gods into a single alter ego servant. It's a lot like Passion Lip and Meltralis, really. Sitonai, the Ainu Dragon Slayer, takes over this composite servant's name, but contained within we also have the goddess Freya, Skadi's sister-in-law, as well as Lohi, the Finnish queen of Poyala from the epic Kalevala. They were summoned as a pseudo-servant into the mortal body of Elia, the Einsburn homunculus known through Fate's Day Night. As a servant, Situnai derives power from her respective deities, as well as from her host Elia. She's very talented in magecraft, particularly enhancement and protection spells. She's adept with a sword, bow and arrow, and her fists. She has her own familiar, a polar bear named Shiro. Yes, that Shiro. And she can even conjure Heracles as a temporary guardian. 
Despite all of the strength, Situnai ultimately found herself imprisoned within Skadi's castle. Skadi did not wish to destroy a servant containing her own sister, Freya. As such, Sitonai's just chilling in a dungeon while waiting for Caldea. Our final servant emerged in part as a response to Ophelia's subconscious wish for a hero to come and save her from this whole Surtur problem. This, as well as the counterforce, wound up summoning none other than Napoleon Bonaparte, the famed French emperor and military leader. He is often regarded as one of the greatest commanders in history, conquering most of Europe under his empire. As a heroic spirit, much of Napoleon's appearance and abilities derive from legends about him rather than just historical fact. In other words, he is mostly a caricature of his real self, hence the more robust complexion as well as the giant friggin' cannon he wields as an archer. His noble phantasm, Arc de Triomphe, in particular, is based off a legend where he bombarded the Great Sphinx of Giza. It's like a big, gay Excalibur, in that it channels the potential of humanity into a large rainbow beam. His ego is equally ridiculous. After being summoned, he made a failed assault on Scotty's castle. When he first met Ophelia there, he proposed to her, despite having been married in his previous life. Thinking the proposal was a preposterous joke, Ophelia did not provide him an answer, leading Napoleon to interpret her silence as a yes. Um... That's not how it works. Either way, during the time leading up to Caldea's arrival, Napoleon visited the various human villages, befriending the children there. With that, we have all the information we need to proceed with the main narrative. To sum it all up, this Lost Belt diverged from proper human history when Surtur gained too much power during the onset of Ragnarok, causing the entire event to fail. Odin managed to seal him in a false sun, relying on the last remaining goddess Skadi to continue to suppress him for the sake of humanity. Skadi and the Valkyries protect a limited population of humans, but are left with no choice but to sacrifice them as adults to sate the violent giants wandering the landscape. Eventually, Ophelia arrives alongside the Lost Belt's fantasy tree Sombrero. When she summons her servant Sigurd, she unintentionally summons Surtur's spirit, too. To prevent Surtur from escaping and torching the entire Lost Belt, Ophelia needs to keep Sigurd alive. Nonetheless, Ophelia takes pity when Brynhilde arrives in the Lost Belt, choosing to seal her away rather than kill her. In addition, Napoleon and Sitonai arrive as free servants, the latter of whom is imprisoned by Skadi. All of this happens before Caldea emerges in the Lost Belt from Void Space. So here we are, psyched to be in yet another snowscape. <laughs> Thankfully, there are blue flames around the mountains to spice things up. Oh, and giants. The giants attack us right away, and so our initial investigation is cut short. To make things worse, Sigurd, being controlled by Surtur, immediately comes to attack the Shadow Border. The magical energy picked up by the border is so friggin' strong that we decide to pull another emergency zero sail to avoid it. Before we can, however, Sigurd arrives, lifts the border up, and totally yeets it. This fucks up our chance to zero sail, and so we have to fight Sigurd directly. Without enough access to energy or mono ley lines, we can't summon our own servants, so it's up to Sherlock to try and defend us with his Baritsu. It's a valiant effort, but in the end he gets his right arm chopped off and a death rune placed upon him. Sigurd then enters the border's cockpit, and to prevent any of Caldea's staff from getting killed, Gordolf hands over the Paper Moon. You know, the critical part of the border needed to perform zero sales. Not like he had much choice. Sigurd's just too strong. The only reason we survive is because the real Sigurd is still in there, doing his best to oppose Surtur's will. So much for sneaking through the Lost Belt. Now we're stuck until we can get the Paper Moon back. Thankfully, while Sherlock is totally wounded, the Death Rune is only a temporary setback to a servant. He'll pull through, but not in time to help us explore the Lost Belt. Once more, it's Ritska and Mashu all alone on their treacherous adventure. As we explore, we quickly find a girl named Gerda being attacked by giants. We save her from being crushed and learn that she's a resident of Village 23. While she's not an adult yet, she still takes it upon herself to look after the village children. Normally, leaving the village is forbidden, but Gerda was out to collect medicinal herbs when she was attacked. Based on our strength, she assumes we're divine envoys, just like the Valkyries who visit the village when it's time for the ritual of ordainment. You know, when adults are forced to leave. 
She seems very naive, so we figure it's best to just go along with it. She takes us to her village, where we learn that there are no adults. We find this horrible, but for Gerda and the other villagers, it's just a fact of life they don't question. We arrive just in time for the next ritual of ordainment. When a Valkyrie comes to evict the adults, Ritska and Mashu fight back. After defeating one, reinforcements are called in. Before long, we're outnumbered, fighting off more than we can chew, until we're rescued by Napoleon. He uses his big-ass cannon to force the other Valkyries to retreat. After we tell Napoleon our circumstances, he offers to join us in visiting Skadi's castle, figuring that's where Sigurd is. Rather than a direct assault, he takes us through an underground passage that leads directly to the throne room. Not bad. There, we encounter not only Skadi, but also Ophelia and Sigurd. Despite us being enemies, Skadi forbids us from fighting. As far as she sees it, friend or foe, Caldea's members now count among her various children. Even as we oppose her lost belt, she extends to us her love. Instead of trying to kill us, she has the Valkyrie through to try to capture us. Between this and Ophelia's mystic eye slowing down Mashu's Orton axe, we're pretty much at a standstill. Napoleon makes another attempt to hit on Ophelia, but it obviously isn't taken seriously. To complicate matters further, Canis, Kirstaria's servant, shows up with a video message from Kirstaria himself. The video is mostly to taunt us, revealing that his Lost Belt's fantasy tree already dominates 80% of the planet. If we want to restore proper human history, we'll need to go through him first. To quell the fighting in her throne room, Skadi uses her runes to disable everyone present and proceeds to take Ritska, Mashu, and Napoleon to the dungeon. With nothing else to do in jail, Ritska takes the chance to form a contract with Napoleon, but during the process, Ritska falls into a dreamlike state. While in this state, Ritska is called out to by, oddly enough, Edmond Dantes. Like Musashi, he can also travel between worlds, and he makes a cameo here to help Ritska in the dream. There, we fight against Heracles, and beyond him we meet Sitonai. She had taken advantage of our contract with Napoleon to force a bond with us. This dark void sure is an odd way of doing this, but I'll take it. We need more servants, after all. After waking from the dream, we're able to see Sitonai in the prison cell. Before helping us escape, she tells us that if we want to defeat Sigurd, we should go rescue Brynhildr. We ditch Skadi's castle for now and head to Galdop again, where Brynhildr has been sealed away by magical flames. We're trying to break the seal when we have our first encounter with the fantasy tree's seeds. Basically, in order to protect itself, a fantasy tree will disperse seeds that fight on its behalf. While in battle with these seeds, Napoleon shoots one with his cannon, causing it to crash into the Hall of Flames, in turn freeing Brynhildr. She breaks out, helps us fight, and agrees to join the party. Hell yeah! On the way back, we stop by Village 67 so Napoleon can check in with the kids there. We learn that, apparently, the barrier on Gerda's village fell and is under attack, so we make an emergency trip to save it. By the time we arrive, however, everything's taken care of. According to Gerda, someone claiming to be from Caldea showed up and protected them. Well, that's nifty. Even though everyone was safe, we take this chance to communicate more with Gerda. She now understands we aren't divine envoys at all. Similar to Patsy, Gerda is starting to learn of life's possibilities beyond her own. This momentary peace is interrupted when the Shadow Border gets attacked by an army of Valkyries. We rush to the Border's aid and fend off the mass-produced Valkyries, in turn drawing out the real ones, Thrud, Hildur, and Ortlinda. These three truly want to avoid fighting against their own sister Brynhildr, but now they feel they have no other choice. They question why their sister Brynhildr is able to fight her fellow Valkyrie so easily, and she explains that as painful as it is to oppose her own sisters, she is a hero with a greater goal in mind. She declares that, in the many years since Ragnarok failed, this world without heroes has caused her sisters to forget what it means to be a hero. Brynhildr, by boasting her own conviction, inspires the Valkyries to do the same. Brynhildr explains that her strength comes from the human heart she developed by loving Sigurd. She clarifies that, after living for such a long time, the three of them must also have developed human hearts that make them stronger. Reluctantly following those hearts, Thrude and Hildur charge their older sister, both getting impaled by her in the process. Defeated, Thrude and Hildur explain that they feel envy in their hearts, envy for Brynhildr's talent and passion. 
The two of them consider this envy proof that they're broken, and so they followed its pull to their own deaths. Ortlinda, on the other hand, is younger than them, considered to be less broken. Thrude and Hildur vanish after telling their younger sister to follow her own heart, believing it will lead to a better fate than their own. Thus, according to her own will, Ortlinda chooses to flee the battle and rejoin Skadi's side for a later encounter. With that out of the way, all that's left is to return to Skadi's castle for another confrontation. Now that we have Brynhildr on our side, we stand a chance against Sigurd. In order to compete on his level, though, Brynhildr activates a primordial rune upon herself. It grants her strength at the risk of burning her own soul. At first, Ophelia tries to negate the rune's effects with her mystic eye, but Brynhildr's conviction wins out. By taking advantage of a technicality, the effect of Ophelia's mystic eye can be subverted. Brynhildr reactivates the rune and uses her noble phantasm, Brynhildr Romantia, to wound Sigurd. Of course, we know that this isn't actually Sigurd, but rather Surtur. Should he fall in battle, Surtur will be freed from his imprisonment. Ophelia realizes that Surtur plans to have Brynhildr kill his temporary body, and so she intentionally makes him stronger via spiritual ascension. This powers up Sigurd considerably, but Brynhildr also gets stronger upon learning that someone is impersonating her beloved. The two of them fight again, and Brynhildr steals the victory, severing Sigurd's Saint Graf. Ophelia tries to undo this with her mystic eye, but by this point, Surtur has also figured out how to escape its effects. Thus, Ophelia has failed. As Sigurd's body dies, Surtur's true body begins to tear through the fake sun. All of the giants who are being suppressed by Skadi's masks become more violent. As intended, Surtur resumes his rampage, hoping to burn his entire world. He kidnaps Ophelia and easily pushes back against Napoleon and Mashu's attempt to fight him. He makes his way north to the Fantasy Tree and absorbs it to become the Lost Belt's new king. This causes more seeds to emerge and attack the party. Now that Surtur is a threat to everyone, Skadi agrees to work with Caldea in order to take him down. While watching this all take place, Ortlinda uses a rune to preserve Sigurd's spirit core, finally allowing him to fight without being possessed. He immediately takes this chance to remove Brynhildr's rune, allowing her to survive as well. The two lovers are genuinely reunited, and Sigurd doesn't hesitate to help Brynhildr, even though she's had a compulsion to kill him. The two can be together, fighting as one, thanks to Skadi's divine authority. Fuck yeah! Surtur targets Village 23, but his attack is blocked when Setonai summons Heracles. Napoleon counters this with his noble phantasm, overcharged to the point that using it kills him in the process. His blast damages Surtur, leaving behind a vibrant rainbow. Before vanishing, he hopes that the beauty of this attack will inspire Ophelia. It is his way of fulfilling the reason for his summoning, to respond to her wish to be saved. Sure enough, this does inspire Ophelia, giving her the conviction needed to break free from Surtur and join us. She knows that Surtur is deriving power from their contract via her mystic eye, and that destroying her eye will weaken Surtur considerably. Thus, she damages her own eye, allowing the overflow of mana to attack her brain. Lastly, she activates her serious light, sealing her demise in order to empower Sigurd and allow the party to take to the sky for their final battle. During the fight, Sigurd activates his noble phantasm, Bulwark Gram, to severely wound Surtur. Its effectiveness stems from Surtur's greed being likened to the dragon Fafnir. The slash is strong enough that it severs Surtur's connection to the fantasy tree, also forcing him to drop the paper moon. Fearing his defeat, Surtur attempts to carve a rune of death onto Ritska, genuinely believing it to work. In truth, however, Surtur is viewing an illusion created by one of Brynhildr's runes. While basking in his own delusions, Surtur is defeated by a joint attack from both Sigurd and Brynhildr. The two lovers deliver their final strike, delighted to finally fight together, even at the cost of their lives. With the battle over, we quickly return to the shadow border to see Ophelia, sadly, on her deathbed. The loss of her eye and the use of her serious light made her death inevitable. In her final moments, Ophelia expresses how she finds it strange that she, a mage, was able to have romantic feelings for someone else. She tells Mashu, her dearest friend, to keep on fighting and prevail against the other Lost Belts. Lastly, she asks that if we ever see Napoleon again, to thank him for the beautiful rainbow. So, Surtur is dead, but we still have work to do. 
the fantasy tree still stands. And as much as we want to destroy it, Skadi simply can't let us end the world she's protected all these years. She, along with Ortlinda, challenge Caldea to a duel for the fate of their respective worlds. Of course, she fails to mention that she's severely weakened by everything that's happened. As such, when we do fight, we win. Accepting this, Skadi cooperates by destroying the tree herself. As such, the Lost Belt begins to vanish. Ortlinda goes to all the human villages, telling the villagers to return to their homes and go to sleep. Gerda realizes that, upon going to sleep, she will never wake up again, and thus won't be able to see all the friends she's made. She doesn't understand the grief she's feeling. Rather than sleep, Gerda steps out into her empty village, and upon feeling a powerful gust of wind, she gleefully jumps, vanishing with her entire world. Like before, everyone in the border feels like crap. We knew we had to deny the Lost Belt, but that didn't make it any easier. Even so, we've got our Paper Moon back and have a clear path to the Wandering Sea. Kind of. Despite driving on a wide, flat plain of whiteness, the border suddenly plunges into a torrential sea out of nowhere. While we're all panicking, we get another transmission from our mysterious mage at the Wandering Sea. She introduces herself as Sion Eltnem Sakaris, and for the first time in over 2,000 years, the Wandering Sea has revealed itself on a day other than December 31st. It seems perilous having our vehicle sink into the stormy waters around us, but thankfully this is ultimately a great thing. To find out why, you'll need to play the game for yourself or get stoked for my next video covering the third Chinese Lost Belt. Look forward to it! Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and, most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of my anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. If you want to support me directly, there are now three ways that all provide the same benefits. You can click Join here on YouTube, or join Patreon or Subscribestar for access to exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate your fandom!